the sun and moon still bow to you and a bed in the stars point to you and this life I had my offering I'll pour it out right back to you cause everything is all for you Yeah. 
Come on, church, let's sing it up this morning. Many will be done in this place this morning. Come on, lift up your hands and worship Him this morning. Come on, we're here to worship God. It's all about Him. It's all about being in His presence this morning. Let that be the cry of your heart this morning. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Lift up our hands this morning as we pray. Come on. Your hands up in the air is your sign of surrender to God. You say, Lord, I lay myself down in this moment, and I come seeking you. So, Father, as we stand, Lord, with our hands lifted high this morning, Father, unto you, we say, Lord, that you are the only reason that we are here this morning, Jesus. We've come to seek you, Father, and we pray, Jesus, that this morning that you will be the center of it all this morning. We lift up your name, Father. We lift up your glory in this place, Father. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you come and you reveal Jesus once again this morning, that we will see Christ, Father, revealed this morning, Father. We thank you, Lord, as we stand in your presence, Lord, that you come and that you bring your peace, Jesus, as you promised, that you've come to bring peace beyond all understanding, Lord. No matter what we face, Father, no matter what we're going through, Lord, we know that we have your peace that is beyond all understanding. So we stand here knowing, Lord, that we are under your grace, Father. We are not under a law, Father. We're not under compulsion, Lord. We are under your grace and your unmerited favor, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we will have a revelation of your love this morning, Father. Your love that knows no bounds, Father. Your love that is unconditional, Lord. It's not about our performance, Lord. It's not about our rank in society, Lord. It's not about our investments, Father, or our income, Lord. Your love is just for us, Father. And so I thank you, Lord. If someone here might have forgotten that this morning, Father, I pray that you remind them, Lord, that you love them so much that you sent your Son. And so we thank you, Father, that we can stand here this morning in your presence, that you saturate us once again with your love, that you overwhelm us with your goodness and your grace this morning, Lord. And so, Father, let us take a moment, Lord, and pause in your presence. Let us recognize your goodness. Let us recognize who you are. You're a good, good Father. You're a God who is for us, not against us, Father. And so, Father, come as only you can. Silence every storm. Remove every lie. Lift every burden. Break every chain this morning, Father. And so we thank you, Lord, this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we know that you are here, that your presence is here, that you come and speak to every individual in the place that they're at, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can gather this morning corporately in your church, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your favor, Lord. We give you all the glory this morning. We give you all the praise and all God's people who have lived that this morning. Come on, let's give him a great big shout of praise this morning. Come on, CRC Paul, lift up the name of Jesus this morning. Come on one more time, give him a shout of praise. Amen. 
Amen. Well, welcome to church this morning. Come on, before you take your seat, welcome someone, greet someone, wave to someone, smile at someone, wink at someone, do what you can. Amen. So good to have you in the house of God this morning. Amen. So great to be back. Amen. Are you well this morning? Gaan het goed met julle? Amen. Het iemand gesê, dankie oom. Well, um, before we get started, just uh, just an update on where we stand with things currently. So, thank goodness our doors have arrived, so they will be installed next week, amen. So, we'll have some doors, we won't be a barn any longer. So, there'll be doors that we can open and shut, and you won't be able to hear the noise coming from the kids' church, amen. And then, um, also, uh, the synthetic grass that we ordered for the kids' church, that is arrived, amen. And all mama say, by a donkey that my kids are not here, I used to go Amen. So the synthetic grass is uh, arriving this week and it will be installed. Amen. So as and when things arrive and as finances allow us, we will start implementing certain things. Can we say a great big amen? Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to continue on our series, God's Plan. And uh, before we get started, sorry, just uh, welcome to everybody tuning in online, all our Facebook and YouTube viewers. And then also a welcome to everybody on our Pal 96.7 FM listening on radio this morning. I'm so glad you've decided to tune in, listening on radio, maybe in your car, at home, in your kitchen, wherever you are. We trust that the presence of God is going to manifest right there where you are in your place. Amen. Come on, let's everybody here. Let's just welcome everybody that's online and watching or uh, listening on radio this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our series God's plan, and before I continue, just uh, just have some grace on the media uh, people this morning. I know things didn't work out as planned this morning, but it's a whole new system that we're working with, so things are a little bit new, so it's going to take us some time to get used to uh, the building. So we don't need on your mouse, I talk to the media, so if you've got some skills, rather go serve in the media, but uh, there's, some, uh, there's some new technology that we're getting to know, and sometimes things don't flow as we want, but we have grace for these things while we work it out. Amen. Amen. So, where was I? We're continuing with our series, God's Plan. And last week, we looked at God's plan for His church and that God specifically had a plan in mind for the church. The church was God's idea. It was God's plan. It's not some man that thought this out and thought maybe this is an opportunity for us to build something, to gain some power, to make some money, however you want to see it. The church, as we saw in Ephesians 3, verse 10, 11, was God's plan to put himself on display for the world to see. Amen. And so we spoke about the ecclesia and what that means. And the ecclesia in the Greek has specific meanings and it refers to various things. And the three things it, it refers to mainly in the New Testament is the local gathering of the church like this. It's the corporate gathering where we get together in the local church. Then secondly, it refers to the universal church. Now the qualification to be, to be a part of the universal church, because Christians love to say, but I am the church and I'm part of the body of Christ, and you are correct in that. But the qualification to be part of the universal church and the body is to be found in the local church. Amen. You can't be part of the universal church if you're not found in the local church, because the universal church has its expression through the local church. And so the third thing that Ecclesia refers to, obviously, is God's people. So we are all God's people, but that mainly is referred to in the, in the Old Testament, and sometimes it's referred to in the books like Corinthians. But predominantly, when the Bible speaks of Ecclesia as the church, it refers to the local church. And so we said last week that buildings don't fulfill the mandate of the church alone, amen? So this building alone does not fulfill the mandate of the church or the purpose of the church. But guess what? Aren't you glad that you're sitting in a building this morning with carpets and soft chairs and there's a roof over your head and you're not sitting in some field this morning, amen? And so this building doesn't fulfill the mandate of the church, but it does facilitate and support it, amen? So you have a braai kamer nodig om een man te wees nie. Maar ek maak het a bietjie beter as jy 'n braai kamer het. Amen. So you don't need a house or physical building to to be a family. 
You can have a wife and kids and you can live in the field out there and you'll still be a family, but a house facilitates and supports the raising of a family. Amen. And so the church is God's plan. This gathering together like we are doing this morning is God's plan. This is God's house. This is God's church. And it was always His plan. And what we as a church want to achieve is not to get you to like me more. My ultimate purpose and my ultimate function here is to get you closer to God. Is to get you more intimate with God. Is to get you into a relationship with God. And that ties into our message this morning. How do we do that? And part of God's plan was His Son, Jesus. And so, if you had to ask yourself and think about this morning over the past year, how often is it that you have spoken about Jesus, that you have told someone about Jesus, that you have meditated upon Jesus, because all this that we're seeing right now is as a result of Jesus. He is central to everything we are doing right now as a church. And somehow Jesus has not been part of the discussion. He's not part of the equation anymore because we're all trying to figure out life and get by with the cards that we've been dealt. But the fact remains, as a Christian, Jesus is central to your life. And He's the one that pulls this all together. All of this started with Him and works through Him. The Bible says in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It speaks about Jesus. And then it continues to say, it says, He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Speaking of Jesus, who was there right from the start, from the beginning, Jesus was there and He was in everything. And so it continues to say in John 1, John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. And so Jesus was at the beginning. Jesus was at the center of it all. And Jesus was the one to come and build His church and reveal the Father to the people. And so Jesus has to be central in everything that we do and what we believe as Christians. And so our scripture verse, Ephesians 3 verse 10 and 11 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display His wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was His eternal plan, which He carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so the plan of God for the church to reveal the glory of God to His people came into play through the person of Jesus Christ. And so in Matthew 16, we see for the first time Jesus declaring His mandate. And it says in Matthew 16, 18, And I tell you the truth. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus comes, and He's with His disciples, and He says to them, I'm here to build my church, and the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. Because guess what? All the enemies and the forces of hell have been released on the earth today, and it's attacking people, it's attacking the world, it's attacking Christians, and it's attacking the church. But guess what? Jesus said the church will prevail. And so if you want to find yourself prevailing in life, prevailing against the attacks of the enemy, then you have to find yourself in Jesus Christ, and then you have to find yourself in the church. You might have some attacks against you, but I promise you, if you find yourself in Jesus, if you find yourself in the church, you will prevail. And so the way Jesus was going to build His church was through another declaration He made in Luke 19 verse 10. And He said, For the Son of Man came to seek 
and to save the lost. And so he says to us, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not succeed against it. My church will prevail. And guess what? If you read history, you'll see that the church found its most growth when it was under attack or under persecution. You want to know the fastest growing church in the world right now? It's the Chinese church. Underground, under persecution. Nothing's going to stop the church from advancing. And so Jesus said, I've come to build my church, but the way I'm going to build it is I'm going to seek out the people that nobody wants. Lost people. We refer to them maybe as a lost cause. Maybe I, I was a lost cause at some stage. I think that most people had given hope, up hope on me that I was going to make any sort of success of anything in my life. It wasn't going well with me at some stage. Maybe in a natural sense, it probably looked like I was okay. But spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, I wasn't in a good space. I was lost. But I can declare this morning, I was blind, but now I see I was lost, but now I'm found because I found Jesus. And that's the only reason my life changed. Everything I tried never worked. I was lost in my sin. I was lost in my deception. I was lost in my fear. I was a lost case, a lost cause. I was lost. But for Jesus. Now, sometimes we look at that scripture, Luke 19, verse 10, and we don't give it much thought because Jesus says, yes, I am the Son of Man, and I've come to seek and save the lost. But here's the meaning of the word lost, and if you fully understand and get a revelation of the word lost, because there's a lot more depth and meaning to the word lost than just the word that we read there. It's not someone lost in a wilderness or lost alongside a road. This is what the word lost means when it's taken from the Greek word apolumai, which in its original translation means certain death, fully destroyed, cut off completely, miserable death, to perish, to die, and to be put to an end. That's what that word lost means. So when you read that word lost, it means that there's a person that at some stage is going to be totally cut off from all hope. This person is going to die in their sin, and they're going to suffer eternity in hell without Christ. That's the depth of the word lost, and that is what Jesus came to do, is to save people from their destruction and going to hell without Him. Amen? And so now the word lost takes on a whole new meaning, because people who don't have Jesus are on their way to complete and utter destruction. They're going to die, and they're going to suffer in eternal mis misery. Now, a lot of people have debated on what hell is like, and if hell really does exist, and Rob Bell stimulated some of this discussion, and even Francis Chan, uh, they sort of started this discussion that this God is a God of love, and how could He create a place called hell? But the Bible is clear that hell is a real place. And so we can't change the Scripture to suit our narrative or how we feel about God. God is just. God is holy. He is righteous in all His ways. And so hell is a real place, and you have to know that. Because if we don't share this message, then that is where people are going to end up. And so Jesus was always part of God's plan. There's in, the, in the Old Testament, there's more than 400 prophecies about Jesus. And I shared with you a couple of years ago the chances of these prophecies becoming true, coming from different points of view and from different people in different times. And I said to you, it would be like taking a 10 rand note and marking it with an X and 
putting this note somewhere in Texas and piling up the money notes up to my knee and saying to you, find that note. That's the chances of all of this being real. And so there's more than 400 prophecies about Jesus. And every one of them have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled as we speak. There's no denying that Jesus is real. There's no denying that Jesus is true. There's no denying that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to settle and believe that. Because that's the message you've been mandated to share. Here's just one prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 10. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hand. And so where did it all go wrong? Because something went wrong. Why are we in this state? Why have we gone from a place of Eden, a place of paradise, to a place of law and sin and death and suffering? What went wrong? And I encourage you, I'm going to refer to some things in Romans 5, but you have to make a study for yourself on the book of Romans. I, I have always wanted to preach a series on Romans, but I'll, be te I'll tell you in all honesty, I don't feel like I have it down like I should. After 16 years of serving in the church, I don't feel like I have it down like I should have it down. And so Romans is a book that I'm still chewing on. It's still a book that I'm going through and trying to gain understanding because the depth of what's shared in Romans is vast and it's deep and it's wide and there's so much covered in it. But for this morning's purpose, I'm going to refer to a few scriptures that are going to help you maybe gain some understanding as to what happened. And if you ever want to study Romans, find the books of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He used to be known as the Prince of Preachers. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached on the book of Romans every Sunday for an entire year. And he break, breaks up the book of Romans, not chapter by chapter, but verse by verse. And seeing what's happening in every verse. So Martin Lloyd-Jones, the likes of R.T. Kendall, those guys, you can read their understanding and their revelation on Romans. But Romans 5, 18 and 19, it says, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. And so there, there's where it went wrong. Adam's sin... Now, I don't, I don't know why it doesn't refer to Eve. But it refers now to Adam. Must save us with God. But that's something I'll discuss with God when I get to heaven one day. But for the sake of this sermon, let's say it was Adam. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Now, many people have an issue with having to pay for a decision that someone else made in a time when you weren't even around, you weren't even a thought. And I'll be honest with you, when I just got saved, this is something that bugged me, is that why must I pay for something that somebody else did? And immediately I elevate, my, elevate myself to a position, probably thinking that if I was in the Garden of Eden, I would have listened to God and I would never have eaten the fruit. But what we have to understand is that God is just and God is righteous. And we understand it maybe for natural things. Because some of your kids will have to suffer the indignity for their entire life knowing that their father is a Blue Bull supporter. They never made that choice. The father did. And so, a lot of times we are so self-righteous and we have an issue with the fact that we're paying for one man's mistake and one man's decision 
not fully realizing that sometimes we've made decisions that weren't too good. And it's had an impact on our family, on our marriage, on our children. But what we have to know is in God having certain requirements, you have to believe that He's just, and that He's righteous, and that He's holy, and that He doesn't make mistakes. I know it doesn't seem fair that we're paying for one man's mistake, but God's righteousness and God's justice is complete. It is fair, even if it doesn't make sense. And I've given up a long time ago trying to get this thing sometimes to make sense because not all of this makes sense. And this word changes you and this word changes as you change. Sometimes when you read scripture, it takes on a totally different meaning to when you read it maybe three years ago or a year ago because as you read the word, the word changes you and as you change, the word changes. And your revelation, your depth of the word changes. And so I have given up on trying to get this thing to make sense. And I've told myself that God is a loving God, that He is righteous and He is holy and He is just and He does not make mistakes. And so the way things have happened and the way they're playing out is according to God's plan. So He is good and He is just. And in order for His plan to be fulfilled, the requirements of His laws and His word had to be satisfied. Romans 5.20, it says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So God didn't leave us in our sins. He gave us His laws so we could recognize how sinful we really are in order to lead us to Jesus. The Bible says that the law actually protected us until Jesus came. But the law could never fulfill God's requirements. Only Jesus could. So look what the Bible says in Galatians 3 verse 23 about the law. It says, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And so the plan was always Jesus. It wasn't some afterthought. And we take scriptures. Let's take a pause break while we get some battery. Thank you, Anay. Is it better? Amen. You still with me? Let's continue. And so it says, the law was a guardian. And so what that means, and even sometimes people have questions about but what happened to people prior to the law. The, there in Galatians, it speaks of that the people that came into the world before the law, prior to Moses, those people weren't sent to judgment. That's how just God was. Because they had no choice. There was no law. They would have an opportunity to choose Jesus. That's why the Bible says Jesus went into the earth and preached the gospel. And so that those who didn't have an opportunity to live by the law or to choose Jesus had an opportunity to choose Jesus. But that's in, I think it's in Galatians 3.25, but it's somewhere in that Galatians 3. But so, because of Adam's sin... The sin nature and death entered our lives and we were all heading for eternal destruction. And it was never God's plan to send people to hell as hell was a place reserved for Satan and his demons. However, God in his holiness can have nothing to do with sin. And anything sinful or unclean would be destroyed 
in His presence. And so that's what we have to understand about God, is that sometimes His mercy doesn't look like mercy, it looks like punishment. But sinful things and unclean things can't come into the presence of God that would be utterly destroyed. And so God put the law in place, and God took Adam and Eve out of the garden, and He said, now you are separated from my presence, I can have nothing to do with you because I would destroy you. That was His mercy at play, because He could have wiped them out utterly and started over, but He rather put them out of the garden, and His plan was set in motion for Jesus to come. Look what it says here in Genesis 3.23, so the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And so the result of our sin was separation from God's presence. Now, I don't know if you recall, but I did a sermon last year, September, about the Garden of Eden, and I said to you it was a place that God had specifically raised up or created or made. It was a garden that God created. It was a garden that God grew and cultivated specifically to meet with Adam and Eve. It was a place where He wanted to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. It was a place, the Bible says, He walked by day with them and He communed with them and He had fellowship with them and He had relationship with them. And that was always God's plan, to have fellowship and communion with us, to be in relationship with us. And so Eden was a place of fellowship where we could delight in His presence. And so God's mercy prevented Him from destroying Adam and Eve, but the result of their sin took them away from fellowship with God. And so Eden was a meeting place where we had relationship and intimacy with God the Father. And it was always God's plan to get us back into a place of relationship and fellowship with Him. That wasn't a punishment for all eternity. But God had to set certain things in motion for His Son Jesus to come into the world. Then all of these men and women that we read about in the Bible, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham and Moses, all of them have their part to play in the story of setting God's plan in motion. And they all had to take the baton from one another to ensure that Jesus could come. And so all throughout Scripture, we see God reaching out to man through Noah, through Abraham, through Moses, through the prophets, through David, through all kinds of characters in the Bible that we see. This was God reaching out to man so His plan could play out in the earth for salvation of all humankind. All these people had to respond to God in order for God's plan to come into reality. After Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't hand us over to our condition, but He kept on approaching us again and again and again and again. We always have to think in the terms of a father or a parent or a mother, is that if our child messes up, we don't put them outside and give them over to themselves and their sins and their lusts. We work it out with them and we teach them and we help them and we maybe rebuke them or punish them. But it's all for their good in order for them to grow up and to become the people that we see they can be. And so the same is with God. You don't as a parent stop reaching out to your child because they are naughty or don't always obey you. Because if you do that, what right have you if we think about the way that we've treated God? And so we understand in the sense of a parent that it takes time and it takes care and it takes all kinds of things to make sure that we mold this child into what we see they can be. And it's the same with God. He never stopped reaching out all through generation after generation after generation. God reached out so that His plan could be fulfilled. It was always His heart to restore Himself back to us and restore us back to Him. So this is true love. Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If it was God's intention 
to punish us for Adam's sins, why then would he sacrifice his own son to die in our place? This is the gospel that we believe, that there's a God who loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. And this is the reality of what Jesus did. Jesus went to the cross with no guarantee that we would accept his sacrifice. Think about that for a moment. Would you give up your life and die for someone with no guarantee that they would accept that or believe that or that would change them or help them? And this is what Jesus did. He had no guarantee that you or I would choose him after his death because that might have been the end of his story. He's dead. Let's move on. That was all just some big story. It was good while it lasted. Because we don't have a very good track record if you read the Bible and if you look at history, if you look how we treated God and sinned against Him and rejected Him and disobeyed Him. And still the Bible says Jesus went to the cross. He had no guarantee that you would accept what He did. And yet here we sit, born again, saved with a purpose and a plan and a future because of the price of one man. But he had no guarantee prior to that moment that we would choose him. The Bible says, yet while we were still in our sin, Jesus died for us. And so we as a church, we have taken up the cause of Christ in reconciling people back to God as stipulated in our mandate. What does our mandate say? Our mandate says to win the lost at any cost. And so whatever it takes, we say as a church, we will reach out to the lost, to the hurt, to the broken, to the destitute. We will reach out to them, whatever it costs. And so this building is part of that cost. It costs us a lot of money and a time and effort to put this place together, although it's imperfect. But the sole purpose of this building is to reach and take care of the lost. And so we'll pay this cost, but to some people, it might not make sense. Why take up a project like this? Why spend this time, this amount of money in a season of uncertainty when there's a pandemic and the economy is bad? And the mandate drives this. And we said, we'll build the church so that we can win the lost at any cost. And so this is the cost that it takes. It doesn't make sense. Because since we've taken on this building, everything has increased. Even my stress levels have increased. I long for the days of that man complaining about the noise because it was one man I had to deal with and an irate headmaster every so often. But we do it so we can win the lost at any cost. And so my hope is this. You take on more in this life, you take on more in this church, you take on more in your career because you're driven by a mandate to win the lost at any cost. Because that's who we are and that's what we do. This is not some clever slogan that rhymes and rolls off the tongue. Because we understand the consequences of living a life without Christ and what happens to people who don't have Jesus. And so we will pay whatever price we need to as a church, to see one more person saved. Amen? Now, to illustrate what I'm saying here, I want us to play a clip. Media, have you got the clip ready? Okay. Lights, camera action. Just turn your attention to the screen, and then we will continue. Down. Please, Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more.
One more. Help me get one more. And so, that movie illustrates what the Christian life should look like. Is that, this is a real movie if you don't know, Hexel Ridge, it's about Desmond Dawes at the Battle of Okinawa. And he single-handedly rescued 75 men by letting them down a rope on a ridge. One man alone. Now, Desmond Dawes was a conscientious objector. That means that he had objected the principles of, of war, and he refused to carry a gun, and he refused to shoot another human being. And so he was a medic in the war, and he never carried a gun. And so there on, at the Battle of Okinawa on Hacksaw Ridge, as they called it, on the other side was the Japanese forces they were crawling out of the caves, and all through that night, single-handedly, Desmond Dawes saved 75 lives. And he tells his own story as well, that that was his prayer. Please, Lord, just give me one more. And so it could have cost him his life. It could have cost him a lot. But he did what it take what it took to save one more life. And so even if this building only saves one more soul, then we've done enough. Even if we have one more soul saved after paying all this price, then in God's eyes, that is enough. And so that's our prayer as Christians, as Lord, just one more, just one more soul. Just one more person I can feed. Just one more person I can help. Just one more person I can pray for. Because what this lockdown and this pandemic has done, it's made us all focus on self again. Protect my interests and protect my investments and protect my life and my family and everything that I have. And I'm here this morning to tell us again that we have to look outside of ourselves again and look for that one more person that we can save. win the lost at any cost. And I believe Desmond captures the heart of what it means to be Christian. That we understand as the people of God, we have been tasked with a great responsibility of telling people about a God who loves them and His Son Jesus who died for them in order to save them from death and their lost condition. And sadly, lost people don't know that they're lost. But how many people in this time have died without Jesus because the church couldn't get to them or because Christians couldn't get to them. And so I believe this needs to be the prayer of every Christian, that we would have the heart of God every day to reach out to just one more hurt person, just one more broken person, just one more hopeless person, just one more hungry person, just one more lonely person, just one more poor person, just one more homeless person, just one more lost person. And this is why we exist as a church. This is why you exist as a Christian. And in closing, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 20, it says, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And so we are Christ's ambassadors. And God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. This is the cry of God's heart through Jesus. Come back to me. This should be our cry as well as a people. 
as a congregation, as a church, as a human, as a Christian, our cry out through all the world should be, come back to God. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet as we close off this sermon. My heart for this message is that you would see Christ and that you would take this message and go reveal Christ because the world, the Bible says, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. How can people believe in a loving God if we don't show Him to them? And so the Bible says we are salt and light. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. The Bible calls us co-laborers with Christ. Yes, I know that Jesus says He builds His church, but the Bible also says that we are co-laborers. Don't think this message is just going to get to people randomly. It's not like people are running to TV or to online programs to hear the gospel message. Unsaved people aren't looking out for online opportunity to reach Jesus. The way that the gospel message spreads is through you and through me. And we do the online thing and the technology thing in the hope that we might just reach one more person. But it's proven through history and through the example of Jesus that reaching out to people and the human touch is still number one in getting people to Jesus. We can't put that mandate aside because of some virus out there in the world. Do you see Jesus rejecting and staying away from lepers? No, He touched them, and He prayed for them, and He healed them. We can't stay away from people. We have to reach out to the lost. That's the message. That's the gospel. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. Just you and God in this moment, watching online, maybe listening on the radio. I want to pray with some people. Maybe you are tuning in this morning and maybe you are here in this building and you heard this gospel message about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was the plan of God for man's salvation. And this morning you realize that maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I don't have this promise of salvation. Maybe I don't have this promise of eternity. I'm uncertain. And if you're uncertain this morning, you can make sure, you can leave this place being certain that you are saved and that there's a place prepared for you in heaven. And that doesn't come by default. That comes by choice. And so you have to choose Jesus for yourself. Jesus doesn't force himself upon you. You are not saved by association. You are saved by choice. And so the Bible says clearly, you must be born again. What does that mean? It means that you have to accept that Jesus is the Son of God, and you have to receive Him into your life as your Lord and Savior, and you choose that by believing in your heart that what we say about Him is true in this Bible, and that I will confess it. And so through the heart you believe, and through confession with your mouth, you are saved. You are not saved because your parents went to church or because you went to Sunday school. You are saved because you hear the gospel message like this this morning and you realize that you need Jesus and then you choose Him. And so maybe there at home this morning, you're not quite sure. And as I'm speaking, the more and more there's a stirring in your heart and you realize that you need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Maybe you are here this morning and watching online. Maybe in this time you've lost your way and you've lost purpose and you've turned your back on your faith. You've turned your back on Jesus. And like the prodigal, you went out into the world and went back to your old ways. And this morning you realize you have to return. You have to come back. For the Bible says in that story, in the conclusion of the story, the father waited every day on the road for the son to return. And so Jesus is waiting for you this morning to return. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to expose you. He's just going to receive you and love you and restore you. That's the Jesus we serve. And so if that's you this morning, and you're saying, I need Jesus, I must be born again. If you're saying this morning, I need to return to my Father 
then I want to pray with you. Then right here where you stand, if that's you and you say, Pastor, that's me, please pray with me. Then right there where you stand, just lift up your hand and say, that's me. Lift up your hand in this place and say, that's me, I need Jesus. Lift up your hand high so I can see. Thank you. I see your hands here in the front. Lift up your hand there at home, just as a sign. Just lift up your hand and say, that's me. I need Jesus. I need to be saved. I need to be born again. I'm reaching out to Jesus. Come on, as you lift up your hand, see that as a sign of reaching out to Jesus. You must be born again. That's the gospel message. One last time, in this place, at home, on the radio. Come on, won't you lift up your hand and say, that is me. I need to be saved. I need Jesus. One last time. One last time. If that's you, just lift your hand high and say, that's me. I'm coming back. I'm coming home. Thank you. I see your hands. You can drop your hands. So we're going to pray this at home, right here in this place. And unfortunately, we're not allowed to do certain things anymore. But I think let's do it anyway. So I just had a change of heart right here as I was preaching. So if you raise your hand. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you wanted to. If you raised your hand, then leave your seat right now. Come and stand in the front here and then meet us here and we're going to pray and agree with you. Come on, every person that raised their hand this morning, come on, leave your seat right now. Come and stand in the front here this morning. Come on, church, let's clap for them. Come on. Come on. Come on, you can face me. Look to me. Look at me. Look at me. Sorry, altar workers. I just changed the plan. Amen. Amen. Come on, keep clapping. If you want to come, come. If you want to come, come. Amen. Amen. Look up at me. This is a great day. This is a great decision. And even though you are young, the Bible says today your life is going to change and that God is going to set you on a new course and a new journey and going to give your life purpose and meaning and things are going to change. Amen. Amen. So come on, let's put our hands on our hearts. And let's pray this together as a church. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died and that you rose again to give me life. And this morning, I receive that life. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I thank you that I'm washed in your blood that I'm a new creation, and that from today, I am a child of God. And Lord Jesus, help me to live this life that you have chose for me. And Lord Jesus, help me to tell people in my world about you. Here is my life. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen and amen. Come on, church, let's give them a great big round of applause. Amen. You can take your seat, and then the altar workers are going to get your details, and they're going to pray with you after the service. Amen. You can take your seat as we get ready to receive this morning's offering. And uh, just a brief message that I want to share this morning. In that, I shared this morning on Jesus Christ and God sending His Son. And God didn't respond to a request. God didn't respond in doubt or in confusion. God responded to the need. And so that response came out of a place of love. He saw that His world was broken his people were broken, his people were lost, and he recognized the need, and he responded to the need of his people. And so that is the heart of God. And so for us as Christians, our response comes from the same place, is that we recognize that there is a need, and that we respond to it. And so many times when I speak to people, in the area of generosity or sowing or tithing or giving, a lot of times I get the spiritual answer of, Pastor, let me go and pray about this. 
and I have respect for your prayer, but that's not the way that God deals with things. And so God says there was a need, and therefore the Bible said He loved us so much that He gave. And so our response as Christians are, I'm not going to shut myself out and think maybe I should pray about this. No, as Christians, we respond like God and we say, I recognize the need and love compels me to respond. Amen. And so, me as a pastor, I don't look who gives and who doesn't. I don't. It's just something that God dealt with me years ago when we planted this church. God said, look to me, don't look to the people or to the finances. And so that's always a thing that I've did, because the revelation God gave me is that Jesus, just like he stood at the temple door watching what people gave, is still watching. And so our response is not to a pastor, it's not to a sermon, it's not necessarily to a nice three-point message. Our response is to the need. And that we recognize that the church of Jesus Christ is His bride, and God put the church in the earth to respond to the needs of the world spiritually, physically, psychologically, emotionally, and that requires partnership, and that requires funding. And so if you want to know what it is that you need to do, look at the need. There's always a need. And people always ask, but pastor, where am I called to? Right now, as Pastor Bill Wilson says, the need is the call. Where is the need in the church? That is where you are called to. And so to complete this church, that's going to require finances. And as I said to you earlier, we address the needs and we complete things as and when finances allow us. But you, as a member of this church, as a partner of Christ, as a co-laborer of God, have to walk into this building and recognize where is the need and how can I meet that. Because I'm not going to stand here and do a series on giving. I will do that only when God tells me to. But for the most part, I want you to respond as a Christian to the need. And say, I recognize it, and I understand my part in it, and love is going to compel me to release a seed. And so there's many things that we need to fix in this building so that it is excellent. Right now, I said to the leaders, all I want this building to be is functional so we can get people into the church to hear the gospel message. But we need to get to a place of excellence and see the work through. And so that is up to you and me. Every one rand helps. Every 10 rand helps. Every 100 rand helps. Every 1,000 rand helps. Every 100,000 rand helps. Every million rand helps. Everything helps. But you have to recognize it and say, I can respond. I see the need and I can respond. And then respond. Don't look around and think so-and-so is going to do it. Because you're not sowing to me or to a building, you are sowing to God. Let that person work out their faith and how they are going to respond, and you work out your faith, and you decide how you're going to respond to the need. And so we put that box there at the back, CRC Cares, to address a need. There are people that are hungry and that need food and they need clothing, and so you can come every Sunday and you can put groceries in that box, and when it's filled up, we will take it to people. You can put old clothes in that box and we will take it to people. We're addressing a need, so we're putting it right there for you to see, and you can fill it so we can address the need. And so love compels us to respond. Let your giving come from a place of love, that I love Jesus, that I love His church, and that I love the world that He died for, and therefore I will give, not because of a clever sermon or a clever book, because love compels me to respond. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come this morning as your church and as your people. And this morning, Father, we choose in our heart, Lord, to respond to you, not to a man, not to a message, but we respond to the work that you're doing in the earth today and that you are using your church and you are using your people to address the needs of the multitudes out there. 
to reach the lost, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to help the poor and the destitute, to do a work for you, Father. And so I pray this morning that you will stir in the hearts of your people this morning a heart of love that will respond in generosity to the need of the day. And I pray, Lord, that on our watch, Father, that we will do everything that is possible, Father, to address the needs in our community, Father. And so I thank you, Lord, this morning, you maybe speak to one person this morning, that they will ask the question, what is the need? And they will see it and they will respond to it, knowing that they respond to you. And so I pray this morning that we will always be a church that responds to the need. We won't respond because of compulsion or pressure or fear or law. We will respond because of love. For God so loved the world that He gave. And our heart's cry is, we so love your church, Lord, that we give. And so give us the grace, Lord, to respond to you. Give us the grace, Lord, to sow the seed that's stirring in our hearts. Give us the grace, Lord, to do more. Give us the grace, Lord, to say just one more, Lord. And so I thank you, Lord, that every seed this morning is blessed. That every seed will produce a harvest according to its kind. That every need will be met. That you will provide for your people. That they will not lack for anything. Father, I thank you for new opportunity. I thank you for open doors. I thank you for blessing. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ushers, you can move swiftly and take up the offering. And then just a reminder, that we have prayer in this building every Monday night at 6.30. So please come and pray. We need to pray now like never before as a church, as Christians. So come out every Monday evening, 6.30. Just buy out some time. Come and pray. We need to pray. We're praying for you. We're praying for families. We're praying for our community. We're praying for the need out there. So please, I ask every person to pray. You'll see also on your seat, there's an envelope if you want to give via Zapper. I think also they put out pledge forms there as well. So you can see there if you want to partner with a building pledge. But there's still much work to do. The next phase is we want to remove all these ugly lights. Um, We've already got a plan for them. We've already got quotes for them. And so to get these lights to a place of completion, it's probably going to cost us about 100,000 rand. But uh, the money is there in Jesus' name to do that. Amen. So uh, we will do it. We will see. The Lord's work will be complete in this place. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we close off. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Father, and for the privilege, Lord, to preach and hear the gospel this morning, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this message will not remain in this building or online somewhere, but it will be a message that's in our heart and a message that we take out to the world. And so I thank you, Lord Jesus, this morning that you stir in our hearts, Lord, the things, Lord, that stir your heart, Lord, the things that break your heart, Father, the things that cause your heart to beat, Lord, for the world out there. I pray that we will see that, Father. I pray that we will reach out to one more person this week, that we'll invite one more person to church, that we'll tell one more person about Jesus, Lord. I thank you, Father, for this message to go forth from this building into the highways and the byways of the places where we find ourselves, Lord. And so this morning, Lord, I pray a blessing over every person here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that that gospel message, Father, will be a message that deep-seated in their hearts, Lord, and that will produce much fruit, Lord. I pray that their lives, Father, as they go into the world, Lord, that their lives are blessed, that you open up new doors, Father, places where they can preach the gospel and not just do business, Father. I thank you that their lives will be a gospel message, that their lives will be a sermon, that people will see Christ in them, Lord. And so I thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Help us. Give us the boldness. Give us the passion and the zeal to spread this message, Father, to all the ends of the earth and to every place that we go. We give you all the glory this morning. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give Jesus one more shout of praise. Amen. And then before we go, uh, 
Mr. John Quipman is back there at the back making some of the best coffee in Paul. Amen. He's also a comedian, if you don't know. So uh, maybe um, if you want a discount, ask him to tell a joke, or maybe you can tell a joke and see how that goes. Amen. But please support John there at the back. He makes amazing coffee, and he'll be here now every Sunday. You'll see him there. And then just a reminder tonight, 6 o'clock for Pastor Art Live on the live link. Come on out. Let's come to church today, this evening. Amen. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you tonight.